welcome Boulder Mountain. My name is Kyle. I'm glad you've chosen to spend this rainy Sunday morning with us here this morning. If we've not met, I would love to take an opportunity after service to say hi, answer any questions that you might have, and it is time for Children's Church. All right. Just a couple announcements real quick before we dive into the text today. Number one, over the live nativity season and Christmas Eve services, New Year's, by God's grace, we had 13 individuals give their lives to Christ. So thank you. Let's celebrate that. So thank you for your investment into Boulder Mountain because you were a part of that. As the year ended, uh, just another update, December was our highest giving month of the year of 2023. We ended the year really strong and well, so again, thank you. Um, if you've given a penny to the ministry of Boulder Mountain, you are a part of helping make disciples as we help people find and follow Jesus. So let's just celebrate that as well. Thank you for giving generously <laughs> to the church. And then in 2024, let me let you know where we're going. Uh, we've had a building back behind our church here. It's not behind, it's actually in the front. It's the first building you see as you pull in. And that's where we have an office and our children's ministry space is there. Uh, actually, it, there are closets for our children's ministry because those rooms are so small. Part of the reason we added a second service was for room and space for our children. And the space has proven to be not acceptable uh, any longer. And so as a church, we want to address that in 2024. We're going to present a plan to you later on this year. The board's having conversation about the best way to do that. But I just want to give you a heads up uh, at the beginning of the year that we need more room for our children and our students. That will be a priority this year. The next generation, they are part of the church today, but they are who we are handing the baton off to. And it's important that we provide safe fun, guest-friendly environments for our, our kids. So wanted to let you know where we're going with that. Would you join me in prayer as we open up our text? Father, I ask, first, I thank you for the lives changed over Christmas Eve and live nativity and New Year's. God, thank you that you are still in the business of saving people, us included. Thank you. God, thank you for the giving and the generosity of this church in the church, but also outside the church. We pray for more of that, that as you have been generous to us, we would be generous with what you've entrusted to us. And Father, I think of those watching online who are not able to come to service today. I pray for those who are sick. I pray for those who are traveling, those who are in a hospital bed. We think of them, we pray for the peace and the power of your presence to show up in a powerful way in their, in their room right now. I think of those in, in need within our church, God, that they would, they would ask and we might be able to meet those needs. I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in the next few moments that, God, you would have your way today. You would move and speak and be really clear to us what we need to do. In Jesus' name, amen. We are beginning a new series today called Taming the Tongue. And just so you know, as your pastor, I've not tamed my tongue. So you can join me as I learn to follow Jesus in this area. This is such an important topic, I felt led to spend an entire month on it. This is not a one-hit weekend where we're just going to hit a topic and move on. We're going to sit here a while for four weeks addressing a really important topic it's a topic that I believe God says we all have power. We all have power. If you are able to speak in this area, you have a tongue, you can speak, you have power, and you have influence. So we're going to spend a few weeks in the book of James. Now, the book of James is a unique book in the New Testament because while Paul's epistles talk a lot about we are saved through grace and by faith alone. That's the Testament of Paul. We are saved by faith and grace. James comes along and says, yes, that is true. We are saved by faith alone, but it is not a 
It is not faith that is alone. It is with works played out in faith. James talks a lot about works and the way you and I are to live our life on a day-to-day basis. James is the Proverbs of the New Testament, if you will. James grew up in a home where the Savior of the world was his brother. How would you like that? He was a skeptic, right? You would be a skeptic too if your brother claimed to be the Messiah. He was a skeptic for a while, and then he placed his faith and trust in Jesus, surrendered his life, and said yes to his brother as his Lord and Savior. So the, uh, James, he writes this book. A few things about the book of James written between A.D. 50 and 60 in that time frame. And then he was martyred for his faith in A.D. 62. So shortly after the book is written, within 10 years, most within 10 years, he's giving his life for the sake of the gospel. He is the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He actually is the council member of the, it's called the Council of Jerusalem, where decisions were made about the early church. He sat on that council. He was a man of influence and leadership. His church was made up of Messianic Jews. So they were Jews who had given their life and recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. So that's the church context. He stayed in Jerusalem, gave his life in Jerusalem, James. A little bit about the book of James. Chapter 1 is an introduction, and then he goes into 12 really practical teachings. I, I call it a blessing punch in the gut. So brace yourself. He doesn't mince words. He's really direct, and he's really clear, and he addresses, hey, if you're going to claim to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there are some things that your life should evidence, should show evidence of your faith. You're saved by faith, but then there should be work in your life based upon that. Of those 12 teachings in a few chapters in the book of James, three of them deal with what we're going to talk about this month our speech, our conversation, the words that we say, the words that we hear. He talks in, later on in the book, he talks about judging others, discriminating against others. He talks about giving favoritism to one person over another person. He's addressing very real problems within his church that he was leading. Uh, Later on, I think it's chapter 5, he talks about let your yes be yes and your no be no. Followers of Jesus should be known as people of their word. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. You follow through with it. We we do what we say we're going to do as followers of Jesus. And if we can't, we don't agree to do it. But if we do agree to do it, we, we keep that promise. James talks about the word perfect, perfect, or perfection seven times in the book, which is the number of perfection. It's kind of funny. I think that was intentional. And he's talking about perfection, that we find perfection in the sanctification process. Sanctification simply means, it's a big church word, it means I'm becoming more like Jesus every day. At Boulder Mountain, that means we make disciples. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? I mean, it's spiritually mature. We're all moving. None of us have arrived perfectly in that. I'm at the front of the line. I, I'm nowhere near where ultimately where Jesus wants me to, but I'm thankful that you're on this journey with me. We're following Jesus. One day we will be made perfect. So James chapter 1, really clear point I want to, for all of us to identify. He says... If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. I need wisdom daily, and that is offered to you as well. If you need wisdom in your life, we know the source, and you have a direct line to ask God for wisdom in the areas that you need wisdom in, probably all of them. That's James chapter 1. Then in James 19... Chapter 1, verse 19. Before we get to James chapter 3, and if you need a Bible, we have them in the back there. They're our gift to you. If you need a Bible, would like a Bible, you can take that. A little side note. Uh, this week I did a little video on 
a systematic Bible reading plan. If you're looking to do that in 2024, there's some tips. Uh, we have a YouTube page, uh, helpful devotionals that go out there. You can subscribe to that and learn a little bit. About how, do I, how do I read the Bible? How do I have a plan? How do I read the Bible? It's so confusing. And there's some uh, helpful video on there. James chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brethren, let every person, who? Every person, every person, every one who's here today, you're included in this. So nobody's off the hook. Let everyone, every person be quick to hear, quick to hear, quick to listen. Oh, somebody said something? Dropping everything. All eyes on you, eye to eye. What did you say? I'm listening. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Just to clarify, not slow to listen, quick to speak. I think we've all misunderstood this. So let's just get the order right. Because it's not be quick to speak, slow to listen. It's the opposite. My parents said you have two ears and one mouth. Do the math, right? <laughs> listen twice as much as you speak. It's probably ten times as much as you speak. Listen ten times more than you speak. Everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and what? Slow to anger. You will be more likely to be slow to anger if you are quick to listen and slow to speak. Leads to being slower to anger. Anger usually results in we hear something, we react immediately without knowing all the facts and without understanding. Now I'm reacting and now I'm angry. And now because I'm angry, I'm defensive and I'm going to give you 10 reasons why I don't like you and why you're wrong. And now my goal is to be right. Now we're in opposite corners and we're having a battle and nobody wins. When you're right, if you try to prove that you're right, nobody wins. And oftentimes the relationship is hurt and damaged. And so what does James say? Be quick to hear. It's worth repeating a few times. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's the context for the next month. You're like, really, we got to spend a month on this? Yes, because it's that important. I believe this will be helpful. If we walk through what God wants for us in this area, it will be helpful for us in our work environments, in our parenting environments, in our marriages, in our community, in our church, if we can be quick to listen. So in conversation, there's two parties involved. We is more important than me when it comes to communication. And then I would say, you are more important than me in, in the conversation. I'm seeking to understand what you are saying. How would our, all of our relationships improve if we just simply did that? instead of reacting without knowing everything. See, every time somebody says something, it makes sense to the person speaking. It always makes sense to the person speaking. We may disagree with it. They may be 100% wrong, but it makes sense to them. So my job, I want to understand what are they saying. I'm going to ask questions. So what you're saying is, hey, help me understand. Uh, teenagers in the room, kids in the room, if you don't understand your parents, Next time you don't understand what they're saying, say, hey, I really want to understand what you're saying. Do you mind rewording that, what you're asking me to do? And wait a few minutes while they lift their jaw off, up off the floor. But seek to understand. I don't understand. You don't understand me. I mean, we've all said that at some point. You don't understand me. Repeat back what you've heard. Because chances are when you repeat back what you've heard, they will say, no, that is not what I said at all. You ever had that conversation? That's not a word. You didn't get a word that I said. You didn't hear a word I said. We've all had that conversation. But what if we began before we speak? Sometimes when someone's speaking to me, you know what I'm doing? Sorry, I'm, I'm admitting here to you. I'm confessing to you. I'm working on it. Sometimes I'm, I'm ready, thinking about my response before they're even done speaking. Right? As opposed to, I'm just going to hear them out. I'm going to listen to them. Be 
quick. May we be, as followers of Jesus, be the fastest people on the planet in listening. Quick. And if I don't have all the information, I'm going to give you or the person that's being spoken about the benefit of the doubt. This is so important in life. Because I hear information and I assume worst case scenario. I can't believe they said that. Rather than thinking about the character of the person and saying, I know that person and my experience with that person does not line up with what I'm hearing. I'm going to fill in the gap with what I don't know with trust, especially in the church community. Let's give each other the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume good intent in our relationships and in our conversations. In conversation, there's two parties involved. I know this is 101 communication. That's where we're going to start. We have a month to talk about this. There's two, two people, two parties. The first person is being assertive. That means they have something important to say. If it's a really big topic, you set a time, you set a place. You say, hey, can we go to breakfast on Saturday? I'd like to talk about this. If you're in a marriage relationship, there's a really important topic. That's going to set a time and place because I don't want to blindside my partner, my spouse. I want to have a conversation. That gives them time to think and prepare. The person who brought the subject up is the assertive person. The person who isn't the assertive person, they're the ones who are, this is a verb, to listen. To actively listen is a verb. That is your role. You don't get to be assertive as well. Oh, you're asking for that. Sure. If I get this, nobody wins. Make the topic the topic. Whatever is brought up, that's the topic, that's the conversation. As soon as you bring up another issue that is important to you, you can deal with that later, but you didn't, you didn't take the initiative to bring up the topic. Then you hear them out. And that whole conversation is just you're seeking to understand. Quick to listen. Oh, ask questions. Be curious. I'm really trying to understand. I'm really trying to walk in your shoes in this subject, in this topic. Before you can solve the problem, you first have to understand. 80% of marriage conflict is just misunderstanding. That's not what we're talking about. Until you can deal with the subject, you've got to agree on what you're talking about. Assertive person and the other party is actively listening. Assume good intent. Be quick to hear. Slow to speak. Slow to speak. The number of words that we all say on average, about 7,500 words a day that we speak. Uh, women tend to speak more. This is a generalization. So it may not apply to you. Uh, but research shows women speak about 10,000 words a day, men between five and 6,000 words a day. Now, that may be different for you. Uh, for some of us, we speak more than we should. Others of us, we don't speak enough. And every one of us, God is speaking to us right now. Either we need to speak up. A number of times I'm in a conversation with a, with a marriage couple, and I hear they never speak. I don't know what they're feeling. I don't know what they're thinking. He never shares his feelings. I use the word he there, generalization. He never tells me what's going on in there. Sometimes we speak too much. I'd much rather be asked my opinion than give my opinion without being asked. Wait to be asked to give your opinion, especially if you have adult children, which I'm learning. God, Psalms, the psalmist, uh, David writes in Psalms, guard my mouth. And then he says, put a gate around it, lock it up, right? Jesus says, take every word captive. Why would Jesus say that? Because there's a whole lot of words escaping this big trap that should never have been said, right? And oftentimes, culture will say, well, speak your mind. What, tell me what's on your heart. Bad advice. <laughs> Don't do that. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked, so please don't tell me what's in your heart. I don't need to hear that. Speak what the Holy Spirit, and by God's grace, he is asking you to say. 
There are times you need to speak and there's times we need to shut our mouth. And God, give me the wisdom to know the difference between those two, right? That sets the stage for this next month. James chapter 1. May we be slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to become angry. For some of us, just that's the message right there. Some of us, we've not addressed anger. And there's anger in us, and it's been an issue in our entire life. We we react, and we fly off the handle, and we say things we regret quickly, and we throw things, and we punch holes in the wall, and, and God does not want you to live that way because he loves you. He says there's a better way to live your life, but at first, it requires us to admit that and then, and then begin to address it. And how do we address it? By first being quick to listen, being quick to listen. James chapter 3 is where we're going to spend most of our time today. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1, James says, In the taming of the tongue, this whole chapter is about the taming of the tongue. Not many of you should become teachers. <clears throat> My brothers, for you know that he who, we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. Able also to bridle his whole body. If you put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are not guided by a very small rudder. They are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. I am not a horse expert. We have a number of horse owners, and people who work with horses in our church. The Johnsons were kind enough to loan me this bridle, and this goes over the mouth of a horse. Horses weigh around 1,500 pounds. If you want to guide the horse to tell it where to go, 1,500 pounds, you put this little bit right here above the tongue. You put that into their mouth. It's got to be center. It's got to be perfectly, not too far back, not too far forward. This is a really important piece to direct the entire horse. You want the horse to know where to go, you've got to be able to control the bit that's in the horse's mouth. Now, this is true 2,000 years ago. James is like sitting at his desk through the power of the Holy Spirit. How do I communicate to the people in my church how to control what they're saying? I don't know all the problems he had in this church, but it was a church, so there were problems. And so he's writing, he's like, oh, a horse. I've ridden a horse before. I've seen. How do you direct or steer a horse? You put a bit in its mouth. You cannot direct the horse without a bit in its mouth. There's another woman in our church who's a horse dentist. I didn't even know they had dentists for horses. It's big business because if that horse's teeth are out of whack, you can't steer the horse. That horse is useless. If there's problems in the mouth of the horse, the steering wheel is broken. So it's really important. So James talks about controlling the whole body. So if we have a problem with our tongue, if we have a problem with our mouth, it affects our entire body. It affects our workplace. It affects our home. It affects our marriage. It affects our relationships with with our friends. It affects our community. If we do not have the tongue under control, there is damage and hurt. There's a ripple effect all around us. You may be aware of that. You may not be aware of that. It's worse than you think. Like, I don't think I have a problem. Wherever level you're at, it's worse than you think, right? By God's grace, the goal is today to not leave here after the service and say, I'm going to try harder to control my mouth. That might last until 2 o'clock on Sunday. It might last this afternoon. I am not asking you to try harder and do better in this area. It begins with submitting, handing our mouth over to the will of God and asking the Holy Spirit, to bring to mind the things that need to be said and the things that do not need to be said. It is not about being right. 
because you can be right and your relationships with others be severed. But what we are talking about today is influence. Influence. If you have a sibling, you have influence. If you have a child, you have influence. If you're married, you have influence. If you have employees under you at work, you have influence. If you have employees over you at work, you have influence. It's called leading up, leading from the second chair. You have influence. I guarantee you someone this week will look at you and wait for you to respond. What are you going to say? You have the power when all eyes are on you with what you say to do one of two things to bring blessing upon that person. You have an opportunity when you're leading a Zoom call at work and everybody's looking at you, you have the opportunity to bring life to that room, to speak words that are encouraging, words that are helpful, words that are life-giving, or you have the opportunity to cut and to speak words of hurt and pain. And we've all received those words. Many of us in the room were scars of the soul based on words that have been said to us years ago. We can remember the day and time and the environment and the weather outside when those words were said because we remember them. It might have been from a parent years ago, 40, 30 years ago. You remember those words. Somebody leveraged their words in an improper way. And I am so sorry for that. That was not God's intent. And my prayer would that be that forgiveness would be extended and received for all of us in this room. Because I've been on the giving side of hurtful words, and I've been on the receiving side of hurtful words. I think of times throughout my life. I, I will say as I was processing this message that the most hurtful, damaging scar-filled words I've ever received have come from the context of a church environment. That's where I've spent most of my time. I've also worked on physical jobs, hard labor when I was in college, and I don't remember words as painful as words I've received from Christians within the church. I don't know what your experience has been. I know early in our marriage, I said some really awful things to my wife. She reminds me of things I've, I said 20, 30 years ago, just as we're talking about our marriage over the years. And I'm like, really, I said that? I can't believe I said that, right? The arrogance and the pride I had. And by God's grace, he's, he's working on me in this area. You have influence in your work environments. There are people looking to you, and you have an opportunity with, to make yourself look good by what you say, by taking credit, by showing favoritism, or you can use your words to be an advocate for someone else, to use your leverage to influence someone else. Every day you have a choice. When you walk up to the cash register, you have a choice. And here's what the word of God says. The word that you say to that person, that stranger who you've never met, has the opportunity to save their life because you don't know what they're going through. You don't know where, the course that they're on. And that simple, kind word could literally save their life. You have power because God's given you a mouth. And you can use that mouth to curse, swear, bring judgment, or to grant life. My mom said it this way. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all wise words. There's an acronym that I've seen recently, and this applies to social media as well. This is not just verbal. James didn't have social media, so he didn't bring up Facebook. You will not win by arguing with anybody online. Let me give you the list of people whose lives have been changed because you argued with them online. That's it. Is what I'm about to type or say true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Or is it kind? Think, T-H-I-N-K. If it is not one, all five of those, then do not speak. Wait for your opinion to be asked. 
Be silent waters that run deep. Be that person in the room. And I would make the case you're the most powerful person in the room. When, you, when people wait for you to speak, as opposed to, I know where they stand because they said before the meeting even started, right? Be slow. Now, he talks about leadership. Now, in the, in the Jerusalem church, there were apparently... He had too many leaders, which might have been the only church in the history of churches where that was the case. But he's saying, hey, I'm recognizing that there are some individuals who would like to teach for wrong motives. If you're looking for a position in the church for a title, that's the wrong reason. If you're looking because you have an agenda to share in your small group, that's the wrong reason. If you're looking for a chance to speak for 60 minutes, that's the wrong reason. So James addresses that. Hey, heads up, teachers will be judged more strictly. Now, we automatically go negative on that, right? You think, oh, yeah, wow, I'm going to be judged. All these things I've said, you know, good things, and, but we're also going to be judged negative. I think it's also for the positive. <coughs> so there's two judgments that we're all going to face. One judgment is for those, do you know Jesus or do you not know Jesus? That's the first judgment. For everyone who knows Jesus, there's a, nudge, there's a judgment seat. And he's going to meet with us. It's going to be good. I believe it's going to be grace-filled. But we're going to have a conversation with Jesus about the ti- time, the talents, and the treasure that he gave to us and how we stewarded that. How did we steward what he gave us on earth? And it's going to be a conversation. That's where... The more position and leadership that you are given, the more responsibility that you have, right? The higher up you go in leadership, the higher the percentage of people who do not like you grows. By and large, everybody, 10% of the people do not like you. Accept it, get over it. The more influence that you have, the possibility of that number increases. Leverage your influence, leverage your power, Leverage your position, not for your sake and your glory, but for the benefit of the others who are looking to you. If God has given you a position as a parent, say to your children every day, I love you, I'm proud of you, I believe in you. Not after they hit a home run or score a 10 at gymnastics or get a gold medal riding horses. Say it to them because they're yours. I would ask my girls growing up, do you know why dad loves you? Yes, dad, we know why you love us, right? Because you're mine. Not because you did anything. Because you're mine. God says about his son, Jesus, at the baptism of his son, he says, this is my son. I want the whole world to know. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. I'm proud of my son. Parents, I don't care how old your kids are. Text them today. I love you. I'm proud of you. I believe in you. If your parents are still alive, call them up. Text them. Thank you. I love you. Speak words of life to your spouse. Right? Let's not be people who are simply reacting. There are times in in my parenting that I wish I could have back. Because you can't take words back, but you can find grace and healing. And some of us have received words from another person 20, 30 years ago, and we've not forgiven them for it. And if possible, as much as it, it depends on us, that we would seek forgiveness for things we've said or things that they've said to us. And that might mean we have a conversation with somebody this afternoon. Hey, I said something to you. I'm sorry. Do you forgive me? It's not enough to say, I'm sorry I hurt you. Do you forgive me means you will never lord it over them the rest of their life. You will not bring it up. and You will not use it against them. Do you forgive me? You all have influence and leadership. James is talking about teachers within the church. If you would like to have a conversation of what it would look like to lead a small group, to work with our students, to work with children and tell them how much God loves them and has a plan for their life, I would love to have that conversation. But the motive is 
so that they might know Jesus, not so that you look good. When I was in children's church, about half the time I got kicked out. My buddy Jacob and I caused a lot of trouble in children's church. It was in the fellowship hall. It was in the basement of the church. And when I got kicked out, they would bring, the teacher would bring me down the center aisle to my parents, and the whole church knew. Oh, Kyle got kicked out of children's church again. And Janet Hall, one of the most godly women I've ever met, she was a, she was a senior woman at the time, and I was probably eight. I remember, I remember the room. I remember the time of day. I remember the corner of the room that I was in where she looked at Jake and I and said, I don't know what to do with you. But one day God's going to use you to change the world. That's it. It stuck with me. It made a permanent mark on my life. I don't know to this day if it was a compliment. <laughs> but listen, it was true. I don't know what to do with you. So I'm going to trust God has a plan for you. Because I don't. Is it true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, kind? Leverage and view the position God's placed you in as a grandparent. You have power and influence as a spouse, as a parent, as a single adult. You have opportunities that some of us in the room don't have. As a Sunday school teacher, as a small group leader, as an elder, as a deacon, whatever influence position God's placed you in to say, I'm going to use the words that God's given me for the betterment of those who are looking at me. This is what scripture has to say about our tongue. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We can all relate to that. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Psalm 141, 3, I need to put this on my mirror. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Ephesians 4, 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We're not talking about what goes into our mouth, Jesus says, Matthew 15, 11, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. We've all met grumpy old people. There's grumpy old men in our lives. They, were, they did not wake up one day and become grumpy. They were grumpy 25-year-olds, and they were grumpy 18-year-olds. They've been grumpy their whole life. They just happen to be old now, and they get a bad rap. <laughs> there are people who might describe some of us as grumpy, because all we hear are negative comments and negative words, and oh, spiritual maturity. What would it look like for us to be spiritually mature, where even if I don't agree, I can understand? And even if I have a preference for something else, I'm going to approach a person. I'm going to speak words that are life-giving, words that are kind, because you never know what God will do with a kind word. For some of us in the room, the action item is to reach out to someone. Reach out to a friend or family member who somebody said something years ago, and you're still holding on to that, and you're bitter and you're angry. Maybe some of us in the room, we did that. We were the ones who said something. For some of us in the room, the action item might be it's time to lead. You've been in a position of receiving. Now it's time to, to teach. It's, it's, yes, you will be judged more strictly. That is true. But you'll also, I believe, you'll see the benefits of that. I, I believe Jesus will pull you in and say, hey, I want you to know you didn't know this, but because you taught I think he pulled Janet Hall in, my Sunday school teacher, and says, hey, when you said that, that made a mark on Kyle. She didn't know it at the time. She passed years ago. I never told her that. You have an opportunity to bring life or bring death by the bits that are in our mouth. 
And you're like, well, I need to get control of that bit. No, you don't. The Holy Spirit needs to control our mouth. Jesus, take the reins. Jesus, take the reins. Holy Spirit, control the bit. I'm getting out of the way. But may the prayer be simply before we respond. Holy Spirit, give me the wisdom to know what to say in this moment. And if necessary, give me the courage to keep my mouth shut. God will answer that prayer. And it's hard because you feel like you, you, God has asked you to defend, be the defender of all things right in that moment. Some things you, we just need to let go. Some things we need to let go. For the sake of the relationship, <coughs> say a kind word. Be encouraging. Be known as the person when you walk into the room, everyone else feels better than before you were there. Right? I would ask that whatever the Holy Spirit's asking you to do in this area of influence, that you would, you would do. Uh, through the course of this next song, as I pray, the team comes, comes to the stage, that you would do business with God in this area. And whatever he's asking you to do, you would take that action step this afternoon. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for, um, uh, for James's text here. I know personally, Father, I wrestled with this text this week and I've recognized I've fallen short many times in my life and I'm grateful for your grace. I thank you for people in my life who've spoken words of great encouragement over me. I thank you for second chances, third, fourth, fifth chances. God, I pray that we would be known as people who have submitted our words over to the will, your will. Thank you for this blessed gut punch today. And would you give us wisdom to know when to speak and when to be quiet? And Father, would you encourage us, even among strangers, when a kind, helpful, encouraging word needs to be said, that we would be the ones to say it. Even if we don't know the outcome, that we would be obedient. Teach us, Holy Spirit, to tame our tongues. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.